This film, made for AT&T Centennial in 1976, traces the technologies of human communications over thousands of years. It starts with ancient mirror signals and goes all the way to communication satellites, from the air to the wires and back to the air again. It's easy to understand the appeal of this award-winning film. Part of it comes simply from the range of interviewees from Alexander Graham Bell's granddaughter to Thomas Edison's assistant to Orson Welles, there is no lack of star power. Look especially for Eldon and Barbara Hathaway, the owner-operators of the last mom-and-pop telephone company in the U.S. in rural Maine. Until 1981, when Hathaway sold the company, their Brian Pond community of around 400 people still used crank generator phones. Every one of their calls were sent through a circa 1939 switchboard at the Hathaway's home. The film's title, To Communicate is the Beginning, comes from ad man Anthony Golly, who coined this phrase for some 1969 AT&T print ads. Reach out for someone. To communicate is the beginning of understanding. Golly revised this a decade later to simply reach out and touch someone. There's a very strong impression you get from this place. This building and the rest of the buildings at this ancient site, you get the strong feeling of a people who are reaching out through the observatory to the heavens around them, to the risings and settings of the sun, the moon, the planets. And through the record they left in these buildings, almost like a book to be read by their people and us across the ages, 
you have the sense that the very essence of communication is this reaching out. The drive to reach out, why man does it, is a clue to his nature. The mystery is this need to communicate. Over the centuries, over the millennia that man has been man, he's had a unique and flexible means of communication, language and speech. Then, suddenly, suddenly when measured in the scale of human history, suddenly 150 years ago, there came an extraordinary change in communication between two people at a distance. That which used to be limited by the speed of a horse was now hitched to an electromagnetic wave and traveled at the speed of light. The change is so profound that we are barely beginning to sense the proportion of it. And as to its ultimate effect, we've hardly begun to guess. Well, inventors uh, are people who are far more akin to artists than they are to scientists. They would try anything. The most bizarre notions would, would strike them as logical. For instance, Edison, in this place here, you'll see things gathered from the, well, four corners of the earth. The, one of the jokes was that he had everything here uh, from an elephant's hide to a senator's eyeball. That when he wanted some peculiar organic device, he did not want to do anything more than shout and say, bring it here. Bell and Edison started their work in communications. Bell started in communications, teaching the deaf to speak. His experiments with the telephone grew out of his interest in the deaf. So he had Watson construct this, which could be made for any, by any 10-year-old. Look at it. It's made of wood and screws and things like that. But it's very subtle, because what he did is he tried to copy in wood and metal, in little screws and spools, he tried to build a model of the human ear. And this is what he's got. You talk in here, just as I would talk into your ear, it drives this membrane, which is his analog for the eardrum. That drives this little leverage, which is similar to the leverage in our middle ear. So, Bell had constructed here a little mechanical ear, which he would intend to use, talk in here, hook these wires to another instrument, the man at the other end would listen to this, then he would respond talking. So the original telephone mode was a one-handed instrument like this, talk, listen, talk. He said himself many, many times throughout his life that the telephone was an outgrowth of his work to help deaf children talk. Grampy. We always called him Grampy. He was wonderful with children. He was always seeking for a way to help deaf children talk. He was interested in everything. He experimented with all different kinds of kites, different shapes, different sizes. His, his mind was always searching. It was this vital need of the human being to communicate with his fellow human beings.
I thought it would be wonderful if we could stop time, arrest uh, the fleeting moment, so to speak, to think how great it would be if the voice could be heard, not just through telephone lines, but reproduced so that it could be preserved for posterity and could be played again and again. Well, the problem was how to do it, technically. And he thought, if a thing spins around fast, it'll emit a sound. Shortly thereafter, he made a sketch and gave it to his mechanic, John Cruzy. And he said, John, make this up. Well, uh, Cruzy made it up and he said, what's it gonna do, boss? So Edison said, that machine is gonna talk. Well, Edison was known to be uh, rather a practical joker, so Cruzy wasn't sure if that was really the purpose of it. They got the machine working, the crowd gathered around over the lab, and uh, this is what it looked like. A piece of tinfoil was on it. They didn't have any tinfoil around, so somebody volunteered a package of chewing tobacco, and they took the tinfoil from there. And then Mr. Edison took this little horn, and he got right near there, and he says, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Then he spun this thing around, and it broke. <laughs> and everybody had a big laugh at that. But Edison knew it was going to work. So they put another piece of tinfoil, and he hollered in there again, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And this time they turned it around and the voice came back. Mary had a little lamb. It was the first reproduction of the human voice. The uh, first words I spoke in the original phonograph. Mary had a little lamb, it speaks with quite a snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. <laughs> The invention of the motion picture would mark a new era, but it is hard to imagine the revolution which was about to take place in communications. After the invention of the telephone in 1876, Theodore Vail had the extraordinary idea that everyone could be connected with everyone else by telephone. He realized that the public would be better served by one publicly regulated company than by a host of competing phone companies. A communications revolution was begun. scientist of his day said it could not be done because of the curvature of the earth. Here it was, 3,000 miles of curving ocean from one land to the other. And just these two stations here at Cape Cod and the tip of Cornwall in England, with nothing in between, just air, space just to be able to transmit through air is just miraculous. But my father, Marconi, his dream had been to help people who needed to communicate. And 
one night in April of 14, 1912, I heard the SOS of the uh, steamship Titanic, uh, which, was, which had struck an iceberg out in the middle, middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I received the relay messages from uh, the Wanamaker station and also direct. But after the, uh, after the Titanic disaster, uh, great progress was made in the form of uh, wireless communication. This was now electronic communication, something entirely new, something that the world had, hadn't seen before. There was very little enthusiasm for this medium. When I got to the point of wanting to buy CBS, my close friends thought I'd lost my mind. Everybody regarded it as sort of a gimmick uh, that wasn't going to last. And I started to think of all kinds of things that could be put out over the air, which could be picked up very easily by not only hundreds of people, but by hundreds of thousands, by millions. And I saw it as something that was going to be a very important means of communication. It's just absolutely amazing. And this has happened in a very short number of years, you know. Here I am, uh, you know, still functioning, or I think I am. And it all started while... Uh, you know, I was a young man, and it's all happened since then. So, uh, not often have that many things happened during one age of a person. But we realize the power of the medium, and Orson Welles wasn't even noticed by anybody. Suddenly did this War of the Worlds, and uh, all hell broke out. And when the uh, interruptions happened during this musical program, by the announcer saying, and now the Martians... Uh, 12 feet tall with fire burning, or 12 miles south of New York and are marching, uh, people just thought they were marching. And there was one town in Oregon, I remember, where right in the middle of it, the lights went out. And my God, they said that town practically committed suicide. They were so frightened. Of course, it made Mr. Orson Welles after that, uh, when he came back from his hiding place, we had sponsors lined up wanting to put him on the air. It's the only poetic mass medium, because one dimension is missing. You see, with television, you see and hear, and with movies, you see and hear, but with radio, you just hear. And therefore, you have an automatic uh, uh, invitation to poetry on the part of the viewer and a demand for effort. There's a drive to communicate. We wouldn't be able to feed ourselves, would we? Or or much less uh, express our love or, or uh, hate or uh, fear or uh, exist without communicating. It's the method of communicating that has suddenly changed, hasn't it? We're in the face of a tremendous revolution, much more profound than after the invention of movable type. Film uniquely reached people with new a new series of visions. Movies gave to the world the chance to press their noses against the glass and look in to see what folks in the big city were up to. I wonder if we don't overuse the word communications. What is it? Is it really communicating or simply sending signals? The real communication is, is always between people. What number do you want? Oh. <laughs> one moment. Will you accept the charge? Thank you. One moment. TSP-1, rooting for Brian Pond, Maine. Operator? Yeah, Mr. Hathaway there. Oh, well, just a minute, Tom. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. Eldon? Eldon? You want to talk to Tom? Brian Pond. Over uh, the past 20 odd years, we've had this telephone company in our own home. Little switchboard in the living room. Uh, we own the whole thing. In fact, we bought it for a uh, little or nothing originally because all we bought was the, the goodwill and what wire that we're hanging around. We have a night alarm bell which rings. Uh, when someone makes a call, it rings, wakes us up, and we rush out madly and answer the phone and connect, make the connections and go back to bed again. 
when we first bought the outfit. I did all the maintenance work myself. Already, Blaine, you can move up this way a little if you want. Yeah, slow him down. Take too much, Rod. Pull the pole down. It's going to drop too much, Tom. It's dropping too much. We've been more or less the communication center, or nerve center, you might say, the community, and most everyone likes to talk. <laughs> Brian Tom. Go ahead, please. I am happy you are here. I appreciate your visit. Would you believe that I am learning to speak? Tweaks. Dwedged. Dreads. Dreads. I am a computer at Bell Laboratories. I am learning to speak and sound more human. It's a perfectly astonishing and, in fact, a few years ago seemed like a ridiculous idea that you could create a thing that sounded like the voice with all the actions of the larynx and the mouth and the tongue and everything else uh, that way. But this is exactly what we have succeeded in doing uh, by the use of a binary signal processor. It was, of course, stimulated, as all these things have been, by our exceedingly practical motive of providing communications, of providing uh, a network. You wouldn't have any of the modern electrical world uh, without the transistor. Uh, the transistor was the first time that uh, anybody uh, found that you could make uh, electrons and waves take various forms inside a solid. Instead of having a tube, a big tube, a, a thing, even a little tube, a tube this size, uh, you could do this thing in uh, dimensions which were really those of the atoms in a crystal. And so it just changed the whole uh, game. So historically, uh, the transistor was one of the great revolutions in communications. The Nobel Prize in 56 was awarded to John Bardeen, William Shockley, and myself for our discovery of the transistor. And the day we discovered the transistor effect was a very eventful day. I can read about what happened that day from my notebook. Using the germanium surface, see top of page 197, and the gold contacts according to the blueprint, the following circuit was set up and was actually spoken over, and the demonstration occurred on the afternoon of December 23, 1947. It really doesn't matter whether you win a big prize or not. The point of an experimental scientist is that he's removed himself from past authority. He has a means of finding out for himself. It is clear that the communications industry has had the knack for self-renewing has been very conscious of the need for quality in, in the way in which it provides devices for people to communicate one with the other. It has been said about technology and people that one can hardly touch a flower without disturbing a star. And it's that kind of total interrelatedness that the managers of the business are going to have to be aware of. It is highly complex. The total national network is made up of so many different parts that it almost is beyond comprehension. But it all ties in one piece with the other and is completely integrated, and it's in that form that we're able to do our communicating and do it effectively. Whenever we are communicating, we're understanding the other side of the world or the other side of the state, the city, the community, or how the other person is living. 
So we want to be understood. And whenever we uh, think of communicating, whether by paper or letter, newspaper, or telephone, it's just conveying our thoughts relating to someone else. I can think back, say, years ago when there was no television or no radio, and it's really good that we have several types of communications. In 1923, I demonstrated a complete electronic picture transmission. We were hoping, of course, only, that by television we can see the things which is impossible to see normally with our eye. Something which was too far, too close, uh, too dangerous, or too impossible to, to see at all. Television can do it. Of course, when we improve the transmission, then we try more and more complex picture. Here is one in 1920 about was close up of the Felix the Cat probably was 30 or 60 lines vertical scanning when I first started to work with television I never dreamed what power it could have and how it would reach out to so many people in so many ways that I never dreamed Roll tape. Right, Four. Three. Two. One, is up on one. one. Music one. tape. You had. One. From Hollywood. One. The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. This is Edwin Payne, along with Doc Severinsen, and the NBC Orchestra inviting you to join Johnny and his guests Robert Blake, Paul Williams, Gabriel one. Kaplan, Four. and Chris Three. Stewart. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellent taste. <laughs> Good evening, if that's very nice of you. I'm, I'm Johnny Carson. I'd like to say a word to the ladies watching at home tonight. I hope I'm the only funny man in your bedroom. thousand billion blinking parts connected by a billion miles of circuitry the nervous system of the human race linking it in a unity no earlier age could have imagined signals flickering chattering pulsing across a continent and around the world spilling over into space, carrying word of our presence here, and this continuing drive, this need to communicate.
Wet City. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at one small step for man. This is WJZ New York. Ici Radio Paris. Un bateau pêcheur, mais nous tiens.